I moved to Ontario, California about two years ago with my family, five months before the pandemic started. During the pandemic, my house would often start to feel overwhelming. My sister and I would take walks to ease our minds and have a much needed breather. We would start by going north on campus and then make our way into the quiet neighborhoods off 4th and Euclid. We knew to go north. It was an unspoken agreed path for the both of us. The difference from south of our new house to north was visible in sidewalk and street conditions. I've been renting in Rancho Cucamonga for over seven years. I have very few concerns regarding traffic safety around my cul-de-sac and I take my evening walks for granted. Those that live in well-lit and well-kept neighborhoods may not think twice about safety and accessibility. Rancho Cucamonga borders Ontario and yet we have vastly different experiences. The question is, what are the requirements for sidewalk safety? And are the states and the cities adhering to these guidelines? What does sidewalk accessibility and general pedestrian traffic safety look like around the Inland Empire? In California, the maintenance of and the adherence to these guidelines falls upon each individual city per municipal code. We took the time to research our local cities to test accessibility and safety. This is what we found. Ontario, California. The city is a bustling expanse of concrete warehouses scattered amongst modest single-family homes and stretches of apartments and condominiums. Mission, a street running west to east lined with homes and warehouses, was our first stop. Standing in the dirt shoulder on the side of the road made us feel uneasy. There was no sidewalks on either side of the road, and the only place for us to stand was on the shoulder where we parked. In other parts of Ontario, especially near their administrative official buildings, such as City Hall and their public library, we found quite the opposite. The sidewalks were nice and the landscape was clean, with no debris in the road. So how does Ontario choose what parts of the city receive sidewalk upkeep? What is it based off of? How do we know what is expected of the city and the residents when it comes to sidewalk safety and accessibility? Rancho Cucamonga, a suburban city of just under 200,000 residents, the child of Etiwanda, Altaloma, and Cucamonga, after the three territories merged in 1977. With the main streets flowing down the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, the city boasts a wide range of businesses, with an eclectic mix of rustic family restaurants, next to streets lined with familiar urban chains in carefully planned streets. What we found in Rancho Cucamonga was interesting. Some parts of the city had beautifully manicured streets with generous sidewalks and larger estates with pristine lawns, while others had limited, damaged, or missing sidewalks altogether. Despite the few areas that scored lower on the qualitative assessment, Rancho Cucamonga overall had relatively clean sidewalks regardless of the median housing price or census block demographics. Fontana, California. Founded in 1913, Fontana began as a largely agricultural town of citrus orchards and ranches. They industrialized post-World War II with the help of Kaiser Steel. The city retained its character of industry with seemingly endless warehouses dotting the desert landscape. Although geographically Fontana is one city, the newer developments in northern areas of Fontana stand in stark contrast to the older areas of Fontana. The neighborhoods we walked were in notably better condition in the northern areas, with sidewalks on both sides of the street. By contrast, many sidewalks in southern Fontana were lacking in safety or were in disrepair. In California, the responsibility for maintenance and safety of sidewalks is at the discretion of each city. When we went to look for answers to explain the discrepancies in sidewalk quality and safety, we found a confusing array of conflicting information. Who is responsible for fixing the sidewalks? Well, we found that while new sidewalks must comply with current ADA guidelines, older sidewalks built prior to ADA implementation or revisions are not required to be reconstructed. Furthermore, despite ADA guidelines being a requirement for new sidewalks, many areas choose not to have sidewalks at all, providing no barrier between pedestrians and motor vehicles. How could we quantify what we saw into graphical data representation? 
My colleagues and I decided to score what we felt best fit the conditions of the sidewalks we found. We created a qualitative sidewalk assessment score. Created this number by having each team member score an area of sidewalk on a 1 to 10 scale, taking into consideration factors such as safety, to include speed limit and average density of traffic, aesthetics, upkeep, and whether or not there was a sidewalk at all. Then we calculated the average score. Of course, it's difficult to factor in every single mile of sidewalk in these cities, so we did our best to take a random sample representing a wide range of neighborhoods and housing prices. Our graphs provide a visual representation of the relative quality of the sidewalks in comparison to statistics such as the median household value in the same area. Fontana provided the strongest correlation between sidewalks, poverty rate, and median household income. For each city, a pattern is clearly visible, with higher poverty rates and lower median home values correlating to less safe or non-existent sidewalks. However, Rancho Cucamonga had an outlier in that many neighborhoods northeast of Wilson and Haven opted to have no sidewalks at all. Our scores of the area without sidewalks are based on how safe it is to walk, with low-speed residential through streets such as Hillside scoring much higher than Wilson Avenue, where there's constant high-speed traffic and no sidewalks. These scores are absolutely subjective. You will see harsher scores because we walked these areas. We drove these areas. Experiencing these roads and walkways in person is totally different than viewing them from the screen, from the comfort of your home. We tripped on these sidewalks. We got dirt and glass on our shoes. We saw in person the debris and debilitated conditions of these areas. Our reactions in these videos are raw and unedited. Oh wow, wow. While we conducted research and recorded our findings, we saw no reason to hide our reactions, thoughts, and feelings about said findings. There will always be differing income levels and house prices. Some people will live in mansions while others may live in urban condominiums or apartments. Some cities have access to larger budgets and public works funds while others may be struggling financially or have older neighborhoods that get ignored in city budgets. So the question that we must ask is, is access to safe, well-lit, and ADA-compliant sidewalks something that should be only available to higher income and newer neighborhoods? Or is it the duty of our society and leaders to make it available to all, regardless of income level or social circumstance?